My golden Bengal, I love you. Forever your skies, your air, make music in my heart. My golden Bangla, I love you. In the spring, the song from your mango groves makes me mad with joy. In autumn, in the full fields, what did I see? I saw a beautiful smile, golden Bangla. What radiant beauty, what sublime shade, what affection, what emotional attachment your mantle has spread from the roots of the banyan tree to the river banks. Oh, mother, the flow of words from your lips strikes my ear like a stream of nectar. When there is a hurt expression on your face, I am immersed in tears. Oh, my bungla, I love you. In this perfect home, I have spent my childhood. By mingling with the dust and the mud of your land, I consider my life fulfilled. At the end of the day, in evening time, when you light the lamp at home, then I leave everything and run to your lap. Oh, my golden bungla, I love you. Those words, now the national anthem of Bangladesh, were written by a Bengali poet who died 30 years ago. The country of which he wrote has seen more hate than love in the last year. Today, another man is charged with the job of returning East Bengal to the state in which the poet really imagined it. His name is Sheikh Mujib Rahman, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Still, we are human beings. We don't like to take revenge against anybody. We want to say, we want to live like human beings, as a free, independent country, and Bangladesh is the reality. We don't believe in revenge. We believe in the philosophy of Bengali life, Love, love, and love. It was known as East Pakistan. It is now called Bangladesh. A new beginning. But there are no roots of love to nurture the birth of this nation. ABC's Howard Tuckner. For hundreds of years, this part of the subcontinent has been a human disaster area. It is no different today for the new nation of Bangladesh and for the Bengalis who live here. Their birthright, their ever-present legacies, are death and mass destruction. The country is devastated. The vital river transportation system is a shambles. The economy is ruined. It is flat, wide open, surrounded by water filled with dung and disease. The new nation has been devastated more times by plagues, cyclones, and typhoons than perhaps any other landmass. The toll has been incredible. One million deaths at a time, human beings. And during the gestation of this new nation, in killing, destruction, and savagery, man outdid nature. In the nine months that the Bengalis fought for their independence from West Pakistan, this is what happened. Pakistani forces and Bengalis supporting the Pakistanis massacred Bengali civilians. Bengalis massacred Pakistanis and their supporters. The Indian Army and Air Force came in on the side of the Bengalis. There was more death and destruction. In thousands of Milais, rampages that made Milai look like a tea party, millions of people died here, and a large portion of the world seemed to shut its eyes and its mind to what was happening. Perhaps it was the civilized mind's inability, as with Biafra, 
to comprehend such staggering numbers of civilian dead. Or perhaps it was more simple, that because the massacred were Bengalis and Pakistanis, because they lived in the strange, faraway lands of the Asian subcontinent, perhaps because they were not Caucasian, that somehow they were subhumans, and that all this really didn't matter much. Out of this savage, hysterical past, the only possible savior during the early months of this new nation could have been Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. To the emotional Bengalis, he's a man of the people, but no mere mortal. To them, he's a godlike man of the people. They need him desperately. He's their only real hope right now. My people love me. People have respect me. The people have confidence in me and my party. And I know that so long I am here, my people will, have, will continue their support. When Sheikh Mujib returned here after 10 months of imprisonment in West Pakistan, the fragile future of Bangladesh was thrust in his hands. Also, the new nation's only Cadillac automobile. He named himself Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, Minister of Home Affairs, Minister of Information. He does not seem uncomfortable with all that power and adulation. My power depends on the love and affection of my people. And I've got the love and affection of my people. I don't know whether any, any leader in any country has got so much love and affection that my people love me. Sheikh Mujib has been stretching the love image a long way during these early days. He's been getting some good things done this way. But the question is, how far can Bangladesh go on little more than love? The real danger is that Sheikh Mujib, caught up in all the glory and adulation, truly believes himself that the power of his charisma is enough to solve the immense problems confronting Bangladesh. Though many of the Bengali freedom fighters, the Mukti and Mujib Bahini, have turned in their arms, as directed by Sheikh Mujib, many others like these still hold on to their automatic rifles. One day they may decide that the country is not being run to their liking. They may want to use these weapons again. One of these boys was telling me, we do not have faith in the Bangladesh force, we do not have faith in the police, we do not have faith in the government. It's only we who are the real inheritors of this independence, and it's only we who will be, who are the real fighters. The Bengali bloodlust still runs deep and hot against non-Bengalis, like these Baharis who were suspected of sympathizing with the Pakistanis. One million of the minority Baharis still find themselves in Bangladesh. At this moment in time, there's no way out for them, no exit. There may be more massacres. And even now, left and right wing extremists are waiting and planning. Peace may not be that permanent here. Massacres, of course, can take place whether it's racial, whether it's political, between the right and the left, between one group of political elements and another group of political elements, between different classes, and also between Bengalis and non-Bengalis, or Biharis as you may call it, call them. And since the problems are immense, and solution does not come very handy, it's a, it's a gigantic task for any government to solve these problems. Convulsions of a political nature will take place year after year. That's my personal belief. Year after year. Year after year. Perhaps Sheikh Mujib's inspiration, his magic, will prevent this. Almost every Bengali and government official says the Sheikh has no weakness. They say he's perfect. Almost everybody in Bangladesh says this and genuinely seems to believe it. Almost everybody, but not Sheikh Mujib's closest confidant, the Minister of Law for Bangladesh, Kamal Hussein. We put this question to him. Now, all men have their weaknesses. What, what do you think might be Sheikh Mujib's? He cannot be perfect. Well, I don't know. I think you might say that perhaps in his, his 
Optimism is a weakness, you might say that, you know, he is an optimist, he always expects things to work out, he has an enormous faith in the capacity of, you know, the people to do things. And sometimes, you know, this kind of optimism may, may mean that uh, you may have put more faith than a situation demands and this, this may lead to certain disappointments. On the subcontinent, it is a small nation bound to India by time, tradition, and need. ABC's Peter Jennings. No one remembers when nature first began to punish Bangladesh, but the recollection of yet another cyclone in November 1970 is still fresh for those who see it now as having been a prelude, a precursor of what was to follow four months later. The following March, however, it was man, not nature, set loose to ravage the land and the people of Bengal. Television was never allowed to record the barbarism itself, only the byproducts. Between five and ten million people fleeing from something we could only see in their faces. The border states of India were soon pockmarked with slums they called refugee camps. This though it was hard to believe was better than what they had left behind. For some, it was still not enough. Many escaped death by violence to find only death by disease. All the good intentions of a sympathizing world never did solve the problems of sanitation and overcrowding. <laughs> A few months later, we could see for ourselves what these people had escaped. We began to understand what they had told us with their eyes. Those of them who became guerrillas had fought for many months. The Indian Army had fought officially for 13 days. Then it was over. Bengal was beautiful again. For many, more beautiful than it had ever been before. It is presumptuous and no doubt impossible to attempt judgment of this nation at such an early date, yet this is not a nation just emerging from the drawing board, but a timeless piece of land on which more than 65 million people hope not only to survive, but to prosper. And suddenly, the people were going home. Many had walked three weeks to escape the terror of the past. Now they were to return on a journey which seemed shorter. The Indian government had spent $450 million on their care. The sooner they left, the sooner India would lighten the present burden on her shoulders. Not all actually want to return. For many, the camps had seemed secure. There is a gnawing uncertainty about what life at home would hold. The future for almost everyone is uncertain. Government officials may speak glowingly of plans and expectations, but they are still guessing, for the government is not yet geared to be specific. Because I have to arrange uh, food for my people first, and there I have to give them houses, because everything has been, everything has been burnt. I have to restore communication system. I have to arrange the employment of my people. That is a serious problem so I am facing. One anticipated problem has not developed. There is not the mass starvation that had been predicted. Barring new natural disasters and given a reasonable amount of immediate aid, widespread famine will not occur. People return from India with two weeks food. And on the land itself, small farms began to function again. Life is simple here, and more easily resumed. In some parts of the country, the war prevented spring planting, but Bengalis for generations have tailored their consumption when shortages occurred, and this year they will do the same. If production increases and the population can be controlled, the people of Bangladesh can eventually feed themselves. It is not enough, however, just to feed yourself. Nor is it enough to dwell on the past, for the future in Bangladesh is rushing in unchecked, 
and the list of priorities seems endless. The most immediate concern, the most urgent, is transportation. Every train that brings refugees cannot also bring supplies. There are few trains running, for there are few railroads which are wholly intact. The Pakistan Army, the Indian Army, and the Mukti Bahini guerrillas, they all had a hand in destruction, each with his own reason. The Pakistanis, to slow the Indian advance, blew the railroad bridges as they fled. The Indian Army tore up tracks to move their tanks faster inland. The Mukti Bahini destroyed bridges to prevent the Pakistanis reaching areas they, the guerrillas, had finally controlled. More than 400 bridges have been destroyed. Their repair means material and money, which for the moment does not exist. Bangladesh from the air often appears more water than land. The rivers are like roads, and it is on them now that the country must rely more heavily than ever. But even here, there are problems. Unused for months, many have silted up. Large cargo boats move only in limited areas. The small, now famous country boat can only carry so much. In the country's two major ports, the situation is similar. Ships sunk during the war blocked the main channels. The mines have been cleared, but until now, no international shipping has ventured in. No shipping, no aid, no export of goods which Bangladesh must sell to earn foreign exchange. In Chittagong, the country's largest port damage is extensive. The Indian Air Force struck hard at the port facility, and new construction here must be added to a long, distressing list of needed repairs everywhere. Chittagong is a stark example of Bangladesh's long-term problem, for even if the port were ready to run, it is doubtful if it could function fully. The skilled jobs here, as with transportation, as with industry, were handled by non-Bengalis. They were from West Pakistan, or they were the now-hated Biharis. Having chosen the side of the Pakistan army, they are no longer welcome. They are the new pariahs in the new society. Sheikh Mujib maintains with angry naivete that if his people can fight a war, they can run a country. The reality of running a crane or piloting a ship has not yet seeped through the national euphoria. From this port at Chalna must soon begin to flow the country's principal export of jute. Here again, the channels are blocked, the rivers silted up. Bangladesh is rich in jute, the golden crop for rope and burlap. It is on jute that the economy will largely rely. Europeans have agreed to buy everything the country can produce. But at the moment, the mills are hardly running. Some are closed altogether, others working at half speed and thereby half production. Here again, non-Bengalis had provided the talent. They no longer work. Here again, even if you produce, you must ship and remember the transportation crisis. It is still a matter of guesswork how much jute can be produced or how much the world will need. It is not guessing to know that without its earning power, the need for aid will increase. Even so, Sheikh Majib talks somewhat naively about his country's potential. I have a very good exportable commodities, like the jute, like tea, like, hy like hydrogen schemes, fish, I have um, forest goods, I can export many things. I can earn huge amount of foreign exchange. But these people have destroyed. I have to reorganize it and start working for that. The Russians have promised massive aid, and so have the Indians. But Indian economists shudder at the figures. Two billion dollars annually for five years, they guess, must come from a country with shortages of its own. Yet more than any other country, it is India which must ensure the viability of the new and partly Indian-created neighbor. Two billion, five billion, ten. With Bangladesh barely a month old, the figures for the future are as unreliable as those for the past. No one really knows how many refugees, how many dead, how many raped. Nor do they know what they need for the future, only that they need. What is evident is that the country is bankrupt in everything but spirit. And the spirit, for the moment at least, seems to make everything possible. 
I'll be able to do it because my people who can give their life for their liberation, they will cover it. And people cooperation is the most important thing. And you have seen that everybody in this country is cooperating with me. Soon enough, the freedom will require a backbreaking commitment. Bangladesh has a population denser even than India. Of 35 million acres suitable for cultivation, only six can be farmed this year. When 500,000 people were killed in a cyclone, their number was born again in 87 days. The economic stability for these people is the only thing that can guarantee their political stability. Without it, they risk anarchy, a new convulsion to shatter the subcontinent and send these people like tumbleweed, drifting into oblivion again. The United States was not the only superpower that found itself backing the losing side, morally and militarily, in the war that led to the creation of Bangladesh. Peking also had given its support to Pakistan and like Washington, may have found itself frozen to its course when the Soviet Union signed a treaty of friendship with India last summer. During the past decade, United States policymakers have had little success in Asia. Now, here in the subcontinent, Washington's prestige and influence have declined sharply for having sided with its longtime ally, Pakistan, sparking anti-US and pro-Soviet demonstrations. The U.S.-Pakistani relationship during the Indo-Pakistan War may have been reinforced by the part Pakistan played in helping Henry Kissinger arrange President Nixon's trip to China. So where Russia is concerned, they stood by us. They gave veto. They helped us. My friendship will continue. That does not mean that I cannot be friendly with other countries also, because I believe in non-aligned, neutral, independent foreign policy. And I am not going to sell my freedom to anybody, whoever it might be. They are courageous words, and Sheikh Mujib may try hard to fulfill that pledge. But because of the dismal state of the Bangladesh economy, they may turn out to be empty words. Foreign aid often means foreign ties. The Soviet Union already has recognized Bangladesh, has started sending in small amounts of food and material. Every day, the Bengalis seem to owe more and more to the Soviets. United States leaders are not expected to recognize Bangladesh or to send aid for quite some time. They should have come forward, at least for the sake of humanity, to save my unfortunate people. Unarmed civilians were killed by the barbarous army of Pakistan. We expected, as a democratic nation, that the United States administration should have been protested, at least to say that don't do this at least for sake of humanity. I, 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 I am sorry. They have not done it. Sheikh Mujib wants USA desperately. In interviews, he tries to mask his feelings about the U.S. government, but on occasion, they explode. You are a very powerful country. I know that. But power comes from the people, you remember it. You have a sufficient force in Vietnam. What you have done? You have fought. You have fought, you have failed to conquer it. You will pick people are against it. Look who can produce the best mechanized army in the world. American government. But you have, you have sent everything to the Vietnam. Have you, is, is it possible for you to conquer it? No. In three weeks, 2,000 miles from this land of golden Bangla, President Nixon will arrive in Peking for meetings with Zhou Enlai. The superpowers have many urgent matters to discuss. The future of Bangladesh and its people may not be high on the list of priority subjects, if Bangladesh is on the list at all. And when the Peking meetings end, they will still be here, waiting for the next cyclone, the next typhoon, the next massacre, and the next day of hope. Amen. 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 Amen.